Shalom, people. Shalom. Hope everyone is having a blessed day. Um, this is Elvin Israel, and I just want to go over a little bit dealing with uh, Abraham as well as the land. I want to have a little discussion. Let me make sure that I'm on oh, the blessed day. All right, there we go. Um, this is Elvin Israel, and I just want to. All right, so now that I know that I'm 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 live and loud. I could begin. First, I want to give honor to the Most High, who is the Father of all, the Creator of all, also to the King, His Son. Let dominion and power and glory be with Him forever. Amen. So now, let's talk more about uh, a little bit about Abraham and the land. Because this is a, a, a subject that, um, you know, we talk about, but I don't think we fully comprehend some of the things dealing with Abraham and the land. So, first thing first, I want to hop into the book of Jubilees, um, chapter 10, verses 29 through 34, just to give a background to the, uh, the promised land. All right, it says... And Canaan saw the land of Lebanon to the river of Egypt, that it was very good. And he went not into the land of his inheritance to the west, that is, to the sea. And he dwelt in the land of Lebanon, eastward and westward, from the border of Jordan and from the border of the sea. And Ham his father, and Cush, and Mizraim his brother, said unto him, Thou hast settled in a land which is not thine, and which did not fall to us by, by lot. Do not do so, for if thou doest do so, thou and thou sons will fall in the land and be accursed through sedition. For by sedition you have settled, and by sedition will thy children fall, and thou shalt be rooted out forever. Dwell not in the dwelling of Shem, for to Shem and to his sons did it come by their lot. Cursed art thou, and cursed shall thou be beyond all the sons of Noah. By the curse by which we bound ourselves by an oath in the presence of the holy judge and in the presence of Noah our father. But he did not hearken unto them and dwelt in the land of Lebanon from Hamath to the entering of Egypt he and his sons until this day. And for this reason, the land is named Canaan. So now we see that the land of Canaan actually uh, belonged to uh, the land of, well, belonged to the, the posterity of Shem. So I just wanted to get that background understood before we actually go into uh, Abraham and some things dealing with the land. All right, so now, what to talk about first? Um... Let's see here. Let's talk about a little bit about uh, the covenant with Abraham. They talked about the land. Okay. It says, God promised Abraham, Abraham that his descendants will receive their own land in which they were to live. So let's go to Genesis. And I'm going to be going back and forth for my notes. Okay. Let's go to Genesis. Twelve. And one and two I'm going to read. But you know this is a part of Abraham's covenant. So it says. Now the Lord has said unto Abram. Get thee out of the country. And from thy kindred. And from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing so one of the things that um, Abr Abram before he uh, received the name Abraham one of the things that he had to do first he had to trust the most high and through that he had to display faith so he displayed faith to leave everything that he knew about and to go to a distant land afar off in order to receive those promises from the Most High. So first of all, just think about 
how big of a sacrifice that was and how much faith that showed in the most high. So now, um, uh, Genesis 15, uh, 18 through 21. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, and the Kenizzites, and the Cadmonites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Raphaims, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gersgashites, and the Jebusites, uh, the Jebusites, yeah, Jebusite, yeah, y'all know these words, man. It's, 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 uh, it's crazy. I got my Mississippi accent going on, real country, and plus these uh, these old timey words get to me sometimes. But we see that Abraham was promised a land for his seed, his inheritance, his posterity was supposed to get a land, right? So. Of his posterity getting the land, a lot of people feel that this is one of the um, the parts of the covenants that, that the Most High has not fulfilled just yet. But I want to keep reading so we can actually uh, get some more insight. Uh, let's go to Genesis 17. I'm going to read 5 through 8. I'm going to start at 4. As for me, Behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. So now, now notice, first it was saying that unto his seed he has given um, um, all the land, right? To his seed. And then later on he says you're going to be a father of many nations with an S. So now I want to show you that the Most High knows the difference between singular and plural. So, seed, singular, nations, plural. Very important. But it says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Once again, it was uh, it was part of the covenant that um, Abraham would actually have kings come out of his loins. So we see uh, a lot of kings coming. But let's see, verse seven, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So first of all, the land of Canaan, what we read in Jubilees, is it was already inherited to Shem. So now, the Most High is just um, coming around and doing what, what actually Noah and his three sons uh, chose to do in the beginning. He's just making everything right now. So, for that land that Shem got, which was uh, part of uh, what they call now the land of Canaan, for that land, it wasn't to stick with, the, with, with Canaan the whole time. He was just pretty much holding it until the rightful heirs came. So now that the rightful heirs are here, the Most High wasn't doing nothing unrighteous. In fact, he was doing something righteous. He was taking that land and giving it right back to the posterity of Shem instead of letting it be under the posterity of Ham. So he was actually doing, he was making the things right again. But uh, a lot of people don't know the fulfillment of that. So let's go over into Joshua, right? Because... We have, in Genesis, we have a, a promise that uh, the descendants of Abraham was going to actually get the land, 
that the Most High promised to them, which was uh, the land of Canaan. But for some reason, like I had some a few debates, uh, a lot of people don't feel that the Most High came through with that. Therefore, they're trying to make this a future prophecy. And they're trying to say that this is what we're still waiting on today. Therefore, Christ could not have returned just yet because we still have some unfulfilled prophecies. And this is one of the prophecies that people uh, go to. So let's see if we can find it real fast. Uh, let's see, let's see, let me check my notes. We're going to go over to Joshua. Let me check it. Joshua. I got 21. Joshua 21. And I just want to start with verse 1, and then I'm just going to skip around. I'm going to go to 1 through 3, and then I'm going to skip around, just so we can have uh, the backstory of uh, Joshua. So now, for everybody out there, uh, right now we're talking about Abram, or Abraham, as well as the land, because this is of importance of today. So, and once again, I know I'm country, and believe it or not, I was a teacher, but... I don't enunciate like people uh, like enunciation to occur. So, I mean, I've, I've been like that my whole life. So we just got to deal with it. So if you follow along, you know exactly what I'm saying. So now, Joshua 21 and 1. Then came near the heads of the fathers of the Levites unto Eleazar, the priest, and unto Joshua, the son of Nun. And unto the heads of the father of the tribes of the children of Israel. And they spake unto them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, saying, The Lord commanded by the hand of Moses to give us cities to dwell in, with the suburbs thereof of our cattle. And the children of Israel gave unto the Levites out of their inheritance, at the commandment of the Lord, these cities and their suburbs. So now, uh, this and then you know they start breaking down the land of Canaan into lots. But once again, we know that Canaan actually was the land of Shem, so that actually belonged to the posterity of Abraham anyway. So once again, they're just getting the portion that they deserve. It's, it's, this is nothing new. This is actually uh, the wrong being righted because uh, Ham came over the descendants of Ham came over Canaan and got into the land of Shem and started to, he liked uh, the land more than he liked his own, of his own inheritance. So he tried to declare it his. So karma came back and it got him. But Joshua 21 and 43, it says, And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he swore to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it, and dwelt therein. So, I want to read it once again. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land, not some of it, not a little portion of it, not some here, not some there, but he gave all the land which he swore to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. So, at the time of Joshua, them entering into the promised land, all of the lands that, that all of that that land mass that we read uh, in what was that uh, Genesis dealing with um, Abram getting all of the uh, Abraham getting the, the land promises with the Most High promise to give to his seed and the seed after him for uh, uh, for the entirety of the generation. Well, we have that fulfillment in Joshua, so we don't have to look for it in our future. For something that we can read was already fulfilled. So, the land promise, the physical land promise, was already fulfilled in the book of Joshua. Israel's land promise 
was already fulfilled in the book of Joshua. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it again. Joshua 21, 43 through 45. And the Lord gave unto Israel all of the land which he swore to give unto their fathers. And they possessed it and dwelt therein. And the Lord gave them rest about. Uh, sorry, gave them rest round about. According to all that he swore unto their fathers. So everything that he swore to give their fathers... Sorry, brother, I'm on I'm on line right now. But everything that he swore to give everything that he swore to give their fathers dealing with the rest in the land, the most high did. So according to all that he swore unto their fathers, and there stood not a man of all their enemies before them, the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There fell not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel all came to pass so every good thing that the most high um, promised Abram it was accomplished fully and respectfully by the father Israel itself had received the, the that type of rest they had received that type of fulfillment and they had received the land. The Most High had provided Israel with everything that they needed. Therefore, we cannot look in our future for this land promise that he gave Abram, uh, Abraham because it was fulfilled already. So, we can't look in our future for this land promise. So, when we have Talks about land that the Most High fulfilled, then maybe it's not this same land mass that he's talking about. Maybe he's giving them something they can relate to because they knew this prophecy and fulfillment already, but maybe it's not this land mass that he's talking about when he's talking about, I will gather them back into the land that I promised to give them because he already gave them the land so he's go he's 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 going to gather them into a another type of land that he promised to give them and just just walk with me real fast I want to go to Daniel 2 real fast and then I'm going to go right back to uh to 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 Joshua so let's go to Daniel 2 just real fast. I want to make a connection. Because we know there's physical and there's spiritual. A lot of people don't want to talk about the spiritual. They're more linear. They want to talk more about the physical. But the Most High, He created everything. The Most High created everything out here. So knowing the Most High created everything out here, including us, he has everything at his disposal he can use in order to convey an ideal to us. That's why he compares in some of the scriptures, instead of um, telling them exactly what he's saying, he compares it to an animal in order for them to get the full understanding. Like today in, uh, so y'all know I'm an uh, ex-elementary teacher. I don't teach no more because of all of the lies, all of the politics. So I left uh, the teaching environment. But uh, they, they have, what's the, what's the system of math called right now? Uh, uh, what is that math called? I, 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 it'll come to me in just a second. But the way that they do math now compared to the way that they did math, it's totally different. Now they have uh, 20 different steps compared to the two or three steps that we had. But the reason behind that is they want the students or they want uh, this generation or the younger generation and further to understand why the math adds up to the way that it does. Because before then, we knew how to do the math. We just didn't understand the numbers or the, or the math system. So, we, so now they break it up into different steps in order for you to understand the backstory of the map. The same way that's how the Most High worked with them back then. 
He used, there you go, Common Core. Thank you, brother, Paul. That's what it is, Common Core Math. I couldn't think of it. And I used to actually teach it. But uh, y'all just can research Common Core and how ridiculous it is right now compared to the way we did math. But it's meant to explain on a deeper level what the math stands for. The Most High used the whole world for his Common Core theme. That's why he was able to use animals and you know how the characteristics of the animal and then he was able to compare that beast to a nation. So in the beginning he said, well, I created uh, the Leviathan and then we see the Leviathan in Revelation. Well, then you got to understand the characteristics of the Leviathan. What all was the Leviathan doing? The Leviathan was pretty much the king of the sea, the biggest animal in the sea. Nobody messed with it. Everybody knew that it was king. It was able to stand on its own. Even mankind feared the Leviathan in the water. Same thing that we see in Revelation. This was a beast. This beast was over, um, over pretty much the people. It dominated the sea. The sea was the people. So we pretty much could see that those same, those similar characteristics. Uh, that's how the Most High uses to explain things. So. When he's explaining uh, a spiritual promise, sometimes he he used linear things or things that that actually already happened to convey the message to the Israelites. So now I want to go to Daniel two, and we go to Daniel two and we look at Daniel two and I'm just going to read thirty four and thirty five. Thou sawest that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. That was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So now I want, I want us to think about that. How you doing, Miss Barbara? Shalom. Shalom, Mr. Martin, Miss um, uh, Elizabeth, Mr. Paul, uh, and some of my Hebrew Israelite brothers out there. I saw you. Shalom to y'all. Uh, I just didn't see y'all names pop up. I see your faces. But Imagine, and I just missed my place, and I just uh, clicked off the place in Daniel. But anyway, imagine it's one mountain, right? It, it started off small, then it became a mountain, and then it then it covered the whole earth. So we know. Could y'all close the door? No. Nope. Sorry, y'all. I have a lot of children, and I explained to them that I was going to record a little bit, but imagine the, a mountain, right? Uh, it's a, it's a part of a. a uh, geographic land, landmass, or whatever, right? So, this is one point, one locale, right? And let's say you stand on that locale, and let's call it um, the Rocky Mountains, right? Let's just call it the Rocky Mountains. So, this rock became the Rocky Mountains, right? So, you know, we uh, Americans, we can go to the Rocky Mountains. We can walk around the Rocky Mountains. We can look at all of the scenic, the the, the scenic routes, and all of the the, uh, the scenery that it has for us, right? But imagine if the Rocky Mountains encompass the whole Earth. What does that mean? That means now everybody on the planet. Is in the Rocky Mountains. If the Rocky Mountains encompass the whole earth, everybody on the planet is in the Rocky Mountains now. So now, think about that dealing with the land promise, right? We have a New Jerusalem coming out of heaven, right? And the New Jerusalem actually, it, it hits the earth and it covers the whole world. What does that mean? That means the whole world is Jerusalem now. The whole entire world is Jerusalem. So, what does that mean? That means now, everybody in the Northern Kingdom, everybody in the Southern Kingdom, as well as the Gentiles, 
has been gathered together in the land because the whole world now is the land of promise. I hope, hopefully that made sense to y'all. So to me, that's just my understanding. To me, the gathering is, in Daniel, when he saw that mountain expand and took over the whole world, that's symbolic to the gospel and the new Jerusalem. And when New Jerusalem comes down and takes, it took over the whole world. Now we have the Northern Kingdom in Jerusalem. We have the Southern Kingdom in Jerusalem. And we have all of the Gentiles in Jerusalem. Everybody in Jerusalem making uh, the land promise come back together, making the gathering occur, making everything that the Most High promised occur under the gospel. That's my take on it. So now, uh, let's keep going. Let's go back to Joshua. Joshua, uh, we read 43, and the Lord gave unto Israel all of the land which he swore to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. I want to go to Hebrews 6. And we're going to stick in Hebrews probably just for a second. Hebrews 6. Uh, I want to read, well, first of all, I want to read Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in, in, in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So now, we have the author of Hebrews saying that first of all, that they were living in the, in the last days in the first century, okay? We also have the author of Hebrews saying that Christ was appointed the heir of all things, which we can see being uh, displayed in Daniel the seventh chapter, when the Son of Man received the kingdom, the dominion, and all of them things. So, what the author of Hebrews is actually doing, he's actually putting the things into perspective to let you know that these things that you heard about in Daniel two, Daniel seven, dealing with the uh, the prophesied son of man, as well as the entire house of Israel obtaining those promises is occurring now. But I want to go to Hebrews 6, uh, 18 and 19, I think. Yeah. Let me go back to Joshua real fast. And it says uh, that by two, well, I'm going to start at 16. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two Immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enter into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made and high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what was the hope that they had? They had a hope for rest. They had a, a hope that they was going to inherit a land and be able to rest. See, the land that they received uh, in Joshua time, and I'm going to read it again. Verse 44, uh, 21 to 44. And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he swore unto their fathers. See, 
the Most High gave them rest, but he gave them a, ty a type of rest. See, they still had hope for a more uh, complete rest, a rest that never ended, a more perfect rest. And they knew that that perfect rest came with the land promise. You cannot have rest without the land. You cannot have the rest without the land promise, the promise of the rest without the promise of the land. That's why we see in Joshua, when they got the land, then the promise of the rest came about. But it was not the rest that the Most High intended for them. It was just a type of rest that they received. Because we know after Joshua's time, Israel did what? Backslid. And it made the Most High have to go against that rest that he gave them uh, in the physical world. So, so, that rest could not be perfect because the, the conditions under it was not perfect. They was under an imperfect covenant trying to have a perfect rest, which did not work. But let's look more of this of this this true land, the land that they had to really inherit before they could actually get that rest. So let's go to Hebrews. I think it's thirteen. Let's start at verse thirteen. Yep. So now. I want to start at Hebrews, uh, sorry, Hebrews 12 first. And it's uh, Hebrews 12, and I want to start at verse 17. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears, talking about Esau. For ye are not come into the mount that might be that might be touched and that burned with fire nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest so what the most high well what the author of hebrews is doing is it's going back to how the most high gave um israel the covenant on mount sinai and it's saying that this is not the mountain even though y'all are under that covenant this is not the, the, the complete mountain. This is not the mountain that actually, this, this is the completion of the type of mountain that y'all got onto in Mount Sinai. So y'all was worrying about uh, that mountain that y'all was worrying about the ideology, the covenant and everything dealing with Moses. And y'all take it all the way back to how the Most High showed and appeared itself on Mount Sinai. This is not the mountain that I'm finna discuss with y'all about. This is not the information that I'm finna relay to you all. This is not the subject matter that I'm finna to explain to you. That's where I get from it. I can only tell y'all what I get from it, and you can read it yourself and tell me what you get from it. But he's uh, verse 19, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which which voice they heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. They didn't want to hear the Most High's words anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the dark. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So now, He's comparing uh, how dreadful that was to the Israelites to receive those commandments from the Most High. Just then receiving the commandments from the Most High on Mount Sinai. He's giving the, uh, the uh, he's comparing to how the, the patriarch, how everybody looks up to Moses during that time in the first century. It was all about the Mosaic Covenant. And he's letting it be known that even Moses had to fear and quake at the sound of the father so now so what he did was he just put everybody had Moses on that pedestal so he just took Moses off that pedestal and made him human again to his readers back then Moses was just a man 
the most high, uh, he was a valuable man. The most high uh, entrusted him, but he was just a man. And the, Hebrew, and the author of Hebrews, which I think it was Paul, but we can say whoever it is, he gave Moses back that human quality. So he says that uh, that Moses that Moses said, "I exceedingly fear and quake." Verse twenty-two. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. So now he's letting it be known that okay. We, everything was about the Mosaic Covenant up until the Gospels. And when the Gospel came, it was taking away that old covenant and bringing in that new covenant under the Gospel. So at this point in the first century, now those people that was listening to the Gospel, they was no longer under that of Mount Sinai they was under that of Mount Zion, a Zion, the real Mount Zion. So, at this point in time, there was two factions of Israelites. You had the Old Covenant Israelites, and then you had the Israelites under the Gospel trying to enter into the New Covenant. Because at this point, remember the author of Hebrews said the Old Covenant was still there. It was just waxing old. It was decaying. So he's talking to the people that seeing the Old Covenant decay, but he's, he wanted them to know that y'all are on a whole different mountain than y'all were before the gospel. Y'all was under uh, Moses. But that that's greater than Moses is here, which is covenant wise. So now it says uh, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So at that first point, let's go to uh, Revelation 21, 22 real fast. Revelation 21, 22. Revelation 21, 22 says, um, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, every several gate." One pearl. So it goes through all. It goes through how the um, how the New Jerusalem was set up. Right. This was that that spiritual. This was that uh, general assembly location under the gospel. This is the same thing as heavenly Jerusalem, which the author of Revelation was actually trying to um, explain how glorious this new Jerusalem was compared to the temple that they was already in. So in other words, I was just making the, the, uh, the, the connection that what you're reading about, that, that heavenly Jerusalem that you're reading about in Revelation is the same place that the author of Hebrews is talking about. I'm just making the, the, uh, the connection. And Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Verse 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. So, let's see where he pulled that from. we got to go to Haggai 2 and 5. So once again, we see the correlation of the, the, the land, some of the covenant. We didn't go over the whole covenant of Abram. But we went through the land promise that was given to Abraham, as well as some of the covenant. And now... We're um, connecting it with what the author of Hebrews said was occurring in the last day. And we're also connecting it with some of the uh, prophecies that he pulled from, as well as Revelation, to show that this all was about the same time, which was the first century. They're all talking about the same subject from their different perspectives. So now, uh, let's go to Haggai 2 and 5. Let's see what exactly 
where he pulled it from. Haggai 2 and 5. Haggai 2 and 5. And I want to start with um, 4. Yet now be strong, O was it Zerubbabel, said the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, said the Lord. The work, for I am with you, said the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenant, covenanted, I don't know how you say that, covenanted, <laughs> covenanted, whatever it is, with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remained among you, fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come and I will fill the house with glory said the Lord of hosts so now we have um, Haggai actually saying when the Most High was coming when, when the Most High came with his power uh, dealing the with the time of the old, let me see right here. According to the Bible, the land given unto Abraham and his descendant is all of Africa plus Arabia, not of Palestine. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I have no comment for that. I can only read what uh, I read from the Bible. So if it goes with what I said, then 100% perfect. Uh, Regardless, Joshua uh, 20 said that that land promise was already fulfilled. But, Haggai 2, dealing with, um, what's that, um, dealing with the, the, the Babylonians. Was it, I believe it was dealing with the Babylonians. And after they destroyed uh, the temple and all that stuff, there was the shaking of the heavens and the earth and the sea. See, at this time, um, the heavens, the earth, and the, sh and the sea, which was all... Um, types of, of temple typology are how they pretty much describe the temple and I can go in my Josephus to show you that in a minute but anyway when the, when the temple was destroyed and all of Israel set when pretty much the southern king said in dismay this was symbolic to their heavens and their earth being shaken and the nations being shaken also so in Hebrews See, that happened at first. So, in Hebrews, it said, once more, just once more, just once more. It's not supposed to happen after that. See, you can't get two or three after once more. So, in the first century, before the temple had been destroyed, it was said that once more, the heavens and the earth and the sea and all those things would be shaken which is what telling them that this temple is going to be destroyed yet once more again urshing it in see they should they automatically knew when that temple was destroyed the new covenant was going to be urshing it in for everyone so this will usher in the new covenant after the destruction of the temple so that land, that temple, that sea had to be shook one more time. Uh, verse 27. And this word, yes, once more signifying the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So now, all of those things that were made by hands was said to be it was going to be destroyed doing that once more shaking or that last shaking. So what do we have that was made by hands back then? Well, we have Jerusalem. We have the temple. We have all of the glorious things that you could not do the Mosaic Covenant without. You had to have all of these things in order to do the Mosaic Covenant. In order for them to be in the covenant with the Most High, they needed all of those things made by hands. So... What was going to remain 
everything not made by hands. That would be the gospel. That would be the new covenant. That would be the people. That would be everything spiritual for the new covenant. As well, we know people are physical also, but this will be the new covenant that remains, everything not made by hands. So, that those things under the gospel, under the new covenant, are the only things that was going to remain because those things were not made by hand. It said things that the things that are shaken are the things that were made. So, once you go back to let's go back to Daniel. I believe it's Daniel 2. Let's see here. Let me try to feel it. Daniel 2 and let's go to 34. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands. So this stone that Daniel saw was the only thing not made with hands. And what did this stone do? It destroyed the statue and it became a mountain and it filled the whole earth. So this stone was the thing that could not be shaken in Hebrews 13. All it is now is it's, it's aligning the prophecy up. So that thing that could not be shaken was that gospel under Christ. It was that new covenant. It was that stone that came and it broke all of the other nations. It's, it was that thing that ended the time of the Gentiles and brought in the fullness of Christ. That one thing not made by hands was the most important thing because it allowed the whole entire earth to become Jerusalem. It allowed the whole entire earth to become a habitation of angels or messengers or sons of God whom we're supposed to be. But, uh, let's see here. Hebrews 12 and 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. So now, wherefore we receive in the kingdom which cannot be moved. So, the first century, he was telling those first century audience, which we are the inheritors of, we are the descendants of these people spiritually, as well some of us physically. But, those people back then was going to receive this kingdom when all of the things that could be shaken, made by hand, left away. So, that would be fulfilling Daniel 7 and 27. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven. See, the kingdom once again was supposed to reach the whole heaven. And that kingdom was what? It was going to be in the holy city of Jerusalem. So if the holy city of Jerusalem encompassed the kingdom, and the kingdom is under the whole, uh, let me read it again, under the whole heaven, that means that that whole Jerusalem has to be what's under the whole heaven. The whole Jerusalem has to be what has encompassed the whole globe or planet or whole world. You cannot go nowhere in the world and be outside of that whole, outside of that holy Jerusalem now. So now, it says, uh, a kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So, then you go to Revelation 20 and let's see here. This is what, 21? Let me, let me find it real fast. Oh, Revelation 21 and 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride 
adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So the author of Hebrews is saying that once that those things that could be shaken are gone away, then this is what's going to occur. The new Jerusalem will be here. The Father will be tabernacling amongst mankind. The new covenant will be here. All of the, the pain, the sorrow, the tears will leave. The hunger will be no more. The thirst will be no more and all that stuff. So now, let's go to Revel uh, no, Hebrews 13 and uh, I'm almost done. 13, I'm going to read 10 through 14. Then I got one more thing in Hebrews to read. And we can conclude. Um, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he may sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach for here we have no continuing city but we seek one to come so they were in Jerusalem right but even though they was in literal Jerusalem they knew that that was not going to be a continuing city they knew that it had to be destroyed it was going to be brought down with the temple in order for the new kingdom to come in. So they were seeking that new kingdom that lasted forever that could not be destroyed. It was, it was going to stay upon earth forever. So this is what they were seeking and let's go to a little bit more of the information and we can conclude. Um, it's Hebrews. Give me one second. Uh, let, me, let me go to my trusty. I got notes everywhere. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 and I'm going to start reading at 8. Why 8? Because that's what we started with. We started with Abraham as well as the land promise given to Abraham. We broke down when that land promise was fulfilled, but it was a type of the true land that Israel was going to receive and be gathered under when the land became the entire planet. That land became the entire planet. Israel was gathered under it, under the gospel, as well as the Gentiles. Bringing in was showing that we were in the new covenant and the new kingdom since 70 AD, and we're in it today. But let's finish it up. Hebrews 11 and 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So right there it said that Abraham, look, look, look what it said, he sojourned in the land of promise. So he was able to go into the land of promise. Isaac and Jacob, heirs of the same promise, was in that same land of promise. Verse 10, for he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's Revelations 20, uh, was it 21, 14? And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. See, Abraham was looking for this city. 
he had already received the promise. He had already was in the promised land, but he was looking for a city whose builder was the maker of God, which is what in Daniel was the stone not made by hand. That's what Abraham was looking for. He, when he got the land promise, when he saw the land promise, when he was able to say, okay, this is what it is, Abraham was looking for something much more. But according to Revelation, what had to occur first? Revelation 12 and 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The 12 disciples had to come and had to uh, fulfill the rest of the prophecy by taking the gospel to the world. See, Abraham could not reach that city yet because he was still under sin. He was still under that old sin that was able to reign in each covenant all the way up into the new covenant. So Abraham was still under that same sin. So even though he knew that city was, was out there, he knew it was coming. He was looking for it, but he could not reach it yet because it wasn't time. Everything hadn't been at that time had not been fulfilled during his time. So he was seeking that city. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. See, all of these people believed. They didn't need evidence. They didn't need to see anything. They just believed. Sarah believed she was going to uh, conceive a child. It sounded funny to her, but she believed she was going to see receive a child or conceive a child. Abraham just left. When the Most High told him to leave, he just left. He didn't ask no questions. He didn't say, but how am I going to live? How am I going to make it? How am I going to survive? He just left. The same thing Christ told the disciples. Take nothing. Take nothing. Just go out and teach. Abraham, they had to have faith in Christ just like Abraham had that faith and he just left. So now, Therefore, verse 12, Hebrews 11 and 12, Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Once again, y'all remember that that new city of Jerusalem was going to have an innumerable amount of angels. Abraham had many kids as the stars couldn't, couldn't be numbered. His, uh, his uh, posterity couldn't be numbered. And they were considered innumerable. So once you come under the gospel, you become a son of God, therefore making you, quote unquote, an angel or a messenger of the Most High on, the, on this earth, on this plane. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Look, though, look. Now, we know that Joshua received the promised land, right? We know Israel received the promised land. Uh, we know they received the so-called rest back then. Not the real rest, but they received the rest until they started sinning. But now we seeing that none of them actually received the promises, which lets you know that it was actually true promises behind the, 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 the physical promise. It's like when the Most High made his statement, he made his statement twofold. He was telling them, you're going to receive this, but he was talking to them in spirit and in truth. You're going to receive this in truth. To me, which is this physical world, but spirit, spiritually also. You're going to receive the promise. You're going to receive my land promise. You receive my land promise in physical, but not in spiritual. So they haven't received all of the promise or the true promise, which was the spiritual promise. But look what it says. But having seen them afar off, they knew they were coming and were persuaded of them and embraced them. And confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. 
So they was confessing. See, look, even though they didn't have the promise, at that time, they were still embracing them. And those promises made them not conform to this world, but be transformed. They were on this plane seeking what was to come. They weren't caring. They weren't caring about this over what was to come. So now, uh, hold on, real fast. Hold on, I gotta knock at the door. Hold on, I'll be right, right back. Oh, okay. You jump out. You jump out. All right, we can. I'll record real fast. Can you do it? She gave me key. I'm letting you know. Uh, okay, then. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, y'all. Sorry. I'm, I'm back. All right. Um, Hebrews 11 and... Um, sorry, let me go to John 8, 56 real fast. John 8, 56 says... Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Hebrews 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off. They seen them afar off. The same thing that uh, John when Christ said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So Abraham saw all of the things, the judgment, and the new kingdom and and um christ having the everlasting dominion and the saints and everything coming to pass abraham was able to see it afar off afar off and be persuaded and embrace it and we see the same thing after uh, balaam when balaam said that he saw christ he saw him afar off same thing abraham saw it afar off and he embraced it. That's all Abraham needed to see. And after he saw it, he was no longer conformed to this world. Just like once we hear the gospel, how can we be conformed to this world knowing that we have something more precious and, 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 and powerful coming under the gospel? We should be out displaying the gospel and what we learn all day, every day. We should be defending the gospel proudly. And trying to get more, could y'all close that door? And try to get more and more people into the kingdom daily. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We haven't, we have actually seen it <laughs> and read it and we believe it and we still haven't displayed it just yet. Some of us, a lot of us have. So let's keep going though. Hebrews 11 and, uh, hold on. Let me let me see if I want to pull that before I go to Hebrews eleven. I'm almost to read it. Second Corinthians four and eighteen. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are not for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So once again. And I can keep going on. Uh, verse uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle was were dissolved. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in heaven. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our house, which is from heaven. So now, this is the same thing Paul was telling the Corinthians. The same thing what the Hebrews are saying about Abraham. They knew that the heavenly things existed. They knew that it was coming under the gospel. So that's what they were desiring. They weren't worried about this world no more. But let's keep going on. 15. Now, not, that's not saying that you got to stop living in this world or doing the things that this world requires you to do. But you should be more on a godly level or more on the gospel, spreading the gospel type of deal and not worrying about what anybody is saying. Our opposition. Don't worry about it. Because you know what we have. And we and you know what's at what's uh, stake for everybody. So you know the stakes are high. 
And for us to get more people into the kingdom, just like we know that it's here and we in it, we're supposed to have that same desire. But now, verse 15, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they may have had opportunity to have returned. Verse 16, but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. The same, look, Sarah, Abraham, all Noah, all of those patriarchs, uh, the 12 tribes, all those, they were seeking the better country in Hebrews 11. These people were all in Sheol, right? They were all dead people. So even though that they was in Sheol, they were still seeking that better country. Right? And y'all understand that a country, landmass, right? Remember, that country is supposed to go over the whole entire world. Everything under heaven is supposed to be, uh, that country is supposed to be rooted in. So, that, that country is a, is a, is a, is a, a spiritual, magnificent place. And the people in Sheol at that time who had not been released because it was not time yet, they were seeking that country. Those people in Sheol was. While we have Paul, who was not in Sheol, he was on the planet Earth. He was in uh, going around the eastern world, the eastern half of the world. He was actually seeking that country also. So we had people on both planes, the, the, the carnal and the spiritual. Or what do you call it? The uh, the temporal and the eternal. You had uh, uh, that's the uh, things here and the everlasting things. You, the the eyes closed spiritually, the eyes open spiritually. You had these two different worlds, these two different planes, these two different realms. Each people that followed the Most High was looking for the same thing. Those alive and those waiting to be resurrected into the new covenant. So everybody was looking for the same thing. That's powerful. That's that's a total completion of a kingdom. When you can rule over the earth as well as the spiritual realm at the same time. That's powerful. But it look but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he had prepared for, for them a city. Christ said he had to leave in order to prepare a place for the disciples as well as everyone else. But mainly, you know, he was talking to the disciples then. But we know that that, that preparation didn't stop with the disciples. But at that time, the city was already prepared. They just had to wait on the destruction of the temple in order for that city to be inhabited by the people in Sheol as well as us today as well as all of the people who was here between 70 AD all the way up until 2019 that city constantly grows it constantly had uh, gets new and new inhabitants if we do what we're supposed to do but that's all uh that's all I I have really. I know it might not have been what everybody wanted to hear, but it is what it is. Uh we have Abraham, some of Abraham's covenant, and then we have the land promises. Um we have the the, the land promises actually the true land promises being fulfilled uh in the spiritual realm under the heavenlies, wherein that country came and it took over the whole globe allowing uh, the northern and southern kingdom to be gathered together in the same land as well as the Gentiles for us all to be gathered together in that same land. Therefore, we don't need any more land promises or prophecies to occur because if you go through scriptures, you see the, uh, the proper breakdown of it. Now, this is just my proper breakdown. If you have a different, that's on you. But i like to say thank you all for listening and I hope... Uh, you might have gained some type of insight from it. And if anybody got any questions, suggestions, or comments, uh, please say it. Uh, I will let this run for another minute before I cut off. But thank y'all for taking y'all time to listen to me. Uh, you know, I, I like coming across new information. I like bringing out old information. 
And um, I guess while I'm, while I'm waiting, I can uh, just ask y'all to um, hey, pick up a King James Version Bible. Uh, pick up a new King James Version Bible. Uh, thank you, Miss Barbara. Thank you indeed. Uh, let me see. And y'all, y'all won't believe how I got this set up. <laughs> it, it's it's kind of wild how I got it set up. I can't even touch stuff real good because how I got it set up. But um, I'll pick up. I got this too. I want to go over this. It's um, uh, the Predators breakdown of da of of Daniel. Uh, I also got a one new man Bible. It's pretty cool. I'm just showing y'all things that y'all think y'all should pick up. Uh, also, Max King, The Spirit of Prophecy. And I have a discipleship study Bible. Not really filling some of the commentary, but I think it's pretty good stuff just for uh, the knowledge and information. Thank you, Miss Barbara, and everybody else for listening. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Uh, a lot more people that uh, you're gone now, so I can't say your name. <laughs> but I know certain faces, so. Thank y'all. I love y'all. Um, shalom and be on the lookout. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do because uh, I'm trying to. I can't. I gotta have like a hundred before I can change uh, my name. And I know that this is not the best uh, doctrine to speak. A lot of people are run from it, so it's hard to get um, uh, followers and stuff. But I'm trying to do my part. So if you haven't described, I mean, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, I always post it, like try to post it once daily. Please subscribe and share. Um, that's all I have. Thank y'all for listening. I'm finna be out. Shalom.